Well, Michael, thank you very much for joining us to talk about all things Pompey ahead of the new season. We've got a number of questions which have been formulated with lots of fan input and fan feedback, so we'll get straight into it. The fourth anniversary of Tornante ownership is approaching. How do you view the progress made up to this point? Well, I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, we haven't been promoted, so that is not progress. But we've behind the scenes, we've done a tremendous amount of work on Fratton Park, on planning, on the uh, training fields, uh, on organizing ourselves. So I think we've had a lot of progress, a lot of investment, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to moving forward. And we'll begin the new season with a new head coach and CEO. What are your expectations for the 2021-22 campaign? Do you see it as a continuation rather than starting again? Well, yes, it's both. It's, it is definitely a continuation. It is uh, uh, moving forward uh, with the Cowleys uh, and with uh, Andrew Cullen and uh, picking up from where Mark, who's... Uh, uh, Catlin, who's still on the board, obviously, uh, left off. Uh, I can't predict how we'll be on the pitch. Uh, I'll let you know in uh, March and April. Uh, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, we'll, co we'll continue being uh, professional, continue being organized, and uh, slowly but surely moving toward what our goal is, which is to be promoted, continually to be promoted, and to play well, be exciting, and just to have a lot of fans uh, at Fratton Park. And Andy Cullen as well, obviously Mark's uh, talked about him very highly. How, how happy are you with, uh, with the replacement that you've come up with for Mark? I think, and this was Mark's suggestion, I think uh, Andrew Cullen is fantastic. And I think we got very lucky. Uh, you know, we were very fortunate to have Mark to continue to have Mark, but to have Mark as a CEO when we acquired the team, that was one of the assets that we, we felt. Uh, uh, his strength and his leadership was maybe the most important reason, well, one of the most important reasons why we were interested in acquiring the club. Uh, and Andrew Cullen, uh, it's hard to believe that, that, uh, that we have somebody as good as Mark. Uh, maybe he'll be better, certainly won't be worse. Uh, and he's very strong and, and, and very professional, um, liked by the organization. And I think we, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to attract him to Portsmouth. But of course, Portsmouth attracted him, not me. Uh, but Portsmouth uh, is such a historic team and, and so well loved that uh, it didn't take a lot to convince, doesn't take a lot to convince people to come and, and, and work for the club. Here's a, a nice optimistic question for you. Will there be additional investment in the playing squad if we're promoted before we become fully self-sustaining? Well, I can't comment on any individual investment, uh, but obviously we want to be sustaining. Um, but if there's a necessity to move the club forward for additional investment, of course, we will make it. We are... We're making enormous investments uh, in the infrastructure in Fratton Park. Uh, obviously, uh, a club, uh, a facility that was built decades and decades and decades ago uh, needs a lot of work. Uh, we're obviously uh, planned to and, and will and are committed to building a new Milton End. Uh, a lot more room for uh, disabled uh, fans, uh, a lot more room uh, for uh, facilities and, and all those kinds of things. So the, the investment in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in Fratton Park, the investment in the academy, uh, and obviously the investment in the on-field and off-field uh, uh, playing apparatus uh, continues. And they're, they're interrelated. We want to be sustaining as a football club because – I learned very clearly four years ago what happens if you're not sustaining and, and you make irresponsible investments and maybe you get promoted, but, but maybe you also go bankrupt. So we're, we're, it's more, I'm more interested in, in having it run well than the, than the unfortunate problems of having to make additional investments that weren't expected. But 
I've, I've been around a while and I know that happens in, in, in high quality operations. Part of the change that we mentioned earlier was a new management team coming in. You're a man who's very loyal to those he employs. How hard was it, therefore, on a personal level that Kenny had to make way? Well, I, I really believe in, in, in giving any executive, or in this case, a manager or a coach, every opportunity to be successful. And I think he was successful. He, 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 his winning streak is quite unprecedented. But there came a time, and, and he understood this, where four years in, we had an opportunity with a new spark plug, let's call it, to, to get promoted last season. It didn't happen in the last game. That's kind of happened to us a couple of years in a row. But Kenny understood. Uh, I talked to him uh, quite a bit about it. I'm very happy that he is relocated and is, is going to do well. He's a terrific guy. I think he handled himself unbelievably professionally on and off the pitch. And sometimes you have to make changes. And uh, at the same time, you, you can't display a lack of loyalty and you can't display uh, hip shooting as it relates to that kind of thing. Uh, there, there was a lot of, you know, there's a minority of the fans who w would like a change every week about something. And, you know, you, you listen to that. And a lot of those ideas are, are pretty good ideas, but still you have to have patience. And we had a lot of patience. I was hoping that uh, it would turn around there toward the end of last season when Kenny was there. It didn't. And Mark and the board and even Kenny understood the reason for the change. You've always spoken about the intended longevity of your family's ownership. Is that still very much the intention? For sure. I mean, we're not, I don't think I've ever sold anything in my life. We're not, we're not, we're not sellers. Uh, you know, we, we, we want to see uh, the, the, uh, an asset like this uh, achieve the goals that everybody wants it to achieve. We wouldn't be making the investments in the infrastructure, in the academy, in the in Fratton Park and around Fratton Park, in the Milton End, in the North Stand, in the South Stand. If we didn't believe, there would be no reason to make this kind of investment, which people in the past did not make. The deferred maintenance has uh, been an issue. Uh, it's a silent issue. It's an issue that the fans don't see that much about, but it's a real issue. And, uh, you know, uh, and it's not just the roofs that has to be reclad or the siding. It's, it's the whole infrastructure. At the same time, it's a fantastic stadium with a great uh, history and a great ambiance. And I don't want to screw that up. And I'm not a fan of all concrete stadiums, even those that people say are modern. Uh, I like them. I like well done modern stadiums. I don't think anything can compare uh, with Fratton Park. And we will get Fratton Park over time, not only back to its glory, although it won't be standing, it'll be uh, seated, and uh, increase the capacity over time as we move up in uh, the leagues. Yeah, on the subject, what is the perfect scenario for you in regards to stadium capacity? And in terms of Fratton Park, have the issues surrounding the stadium been bigger than you first envisaged? Well, everything is bigger than you first envisioned. When you buy something, you don't want to look at the, you know, you should, you should look at every crack and ward there is. But, you know, we, we were so enthusiastic that we did a lot of due diligence on the stadium. But yes, a lot of it has uh, crept up. And we want to be super careful with safety and and uh, fan uh, accessibility and all those things, probably more than we, we required. But I think that's part of the feeling of, a, uh, of going to a, a great match. The issue on capacity is not even, is not really an issue that the club has. It's an issue for the city because too much capacity won't work on that on the island. It's just the, the, the road structure, the infrastructure, the railroad station. There's just so much capacity on a, on a Saturday or a Tuesday evening or whenever that that can withstand those number of people. So we don't want to leave the island. There's something about it that, that's magic. Uh, 
And therefore we have a, a limit to the size of the stadium and the size of the city. And we will keep encouraging the city to make it easier to expand. But I don't know, it's, uh, we're certainly gonna get back up to 20,000 with, with the new Milton end, uh, maybe 25, 30,000 over time. I don't see it being the city being able to support uh, a 50 or 60,000, even in, even in the Premier League, it just would, would probably is not workable. Um, but we'll see where it goes. I mean, first we got to get on the pitch and move up. We got to get the, the uh, Fratton Park back to where it should be in all the areas of, of, of bathrooms and safety and exits and all those things, entrances. Uh, and that takes time. And we have, I think we have a plan that we've submitted or announced a four-year plan to get to that point. And, you know, we, we have to do it mostly in the downtime in the summers. Uh, we don't want to shut the stadium down for two years. So it, it's moving along at a good pace, but not at a crazy pace. And of course, it's not just work going into Fratton Park, it's the training ground as well. This is the first time that the club has owned its own training ground. How significant will that be in terms of the club's progression? And what's the vision for that site? Well, two things came together. It's time for, for Portsmouth Football Club to have its own training ground. It's time for the football club to have a consistency of where to train, consistency of the locker rooms, the, the exercise rooms and all that. I don't know whether that actually scores goals, but it's the right thing to do. And the opportunity came up uh, that it was affordable, not cheap, but affordable. Uh, and we moved quickly when, when, when that became an opportunity. We also only insisted or, or insisted that, that we wouldn't do it unless we owned the land itself, which we, we have done. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, actually, the facility, it needs, again, just like Fratton Park, the, the, the gym needs work. The pool needs work. It leaks. I won't go into all, all the things that have to be done, but uh, they are being done. And I think there's a, a pride in owning your own training ground, your own academy, and, 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 and those kinds of things. Let's talk about the academy. Greg Miller has recently been appointed academy manager. Are you satisfied that the academy can produce the young stars of the future and fulfill the prophecy you first made at the Guild Hall? Well, I think we will fulfill the prophecy. I can tell you that I think having the academy, uh, funding the academy, having the academy be important for Portsmouth will in the end pay off. I, I can't tell you when that will happen or how that will happen but I've seen it happen around football through the whole UK. I've seen it happen actually in Portsmouth itself. There are players from Portsmouth that have done very well in, in our football club and also elsewhere. So I can't see it not being helpful, but as to telling you why and how, other than believing in, in Andrew that he, he, he and Mark picked the right person uh, is all I really can say about that. Because of obviously the state of the world, it, it means that you haven't been able to make your usual visits over to the UK and over to Portsmouth. So you've had to, to a certain extent, rely on social media to, to keep in touch with the Pompey family. How do you and your family deal with fan comments on social media, both positive and negative? That's a, that's a difficult question. It's a great place for people to uh, project their anxiety and their anger and it often their praise. I think it's a small group of fans that, that project a lot of the noise on social media. And, and you know, we had uh, an unfortunate experience recently with uh, some of the other 18 year old players saying things they wish they hadn't said, and we're dealing with that. Uh, and that's part of social media. And it's part of growing up Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and others learning how to operate in that world of, of anger and, and, and the like. I personally enjoy it. I like, uh, I like reading the bad with the good. I like reading, 
you know, getting a sense of the, some of the time it's the minority of the fans. Sometimes it's not, uh, you can't react off of it every time you, you read something. Uh, it also gives us an ability to react quickly. For instance, reacting off what happened uh, with the under 18 year olds in their inappropriate uh, conversations to, to me, to be able to quickly get to the fans and say, we won't stand for this. This is inappropriate behavior and, and, and the rest. Uh, social media is, is a completely new uh, business environment. You can use it successfully. I think we do to promote the, the club, to promote the games, to do interviews like we're doing now. So in that sense, mostly it's good. And like everything, there are a few bad apples in what's always mostly good. And we just have to deal with that. So I think it's a great way to communicate with the fans. It's a great way for the fans to know what's going on. Uh, that, you know, Portsmouth is one of the few cities left that have meaningful newspapers. So there is information for the fans in the Portsmouth news. But, mo but, but still, I think a lot of the information comes from the club, through social media, from the fans, and certainly in a lot of other cities where the newspapers have kind of folded. Not as much in the UK as in uh, the US. Michael, it's fantastic to talk to you. We really appreciate your time and hopefully we'll see you back at Fratton Park in person soon. I'll be there.